Uh, greetings, everyone. We just kind of started admitting uh, folks into tonight's uh, seminar about uh, expanding Toronto Limited Projects in Michigan. Um, my name is Dave DeYoung. I uh, have participated in the board for a long time and helped make these things happen. Um, we've got uh, Lance Climey here. He's going to chat for a little bit, and um, we are going to continue to to admit folks. And Lance will introduce our uh, all of our speakers here. I um, want to let you know, you know, we're, we're pretty much leaving folks muted throughout the course of the uh, discussion. Um, but if we want to open it up, we probably can. It uh, doesn't look like there's so many that we'd get a lot of chatter, but uh, we'll leave you quiet for the time being. Um, and if, if you do have questions, uh, you're welcome to put them into the chat window. Um, and I'll be monitoring that and I, I can pass those along. Um, and. Uh, and then we can ask some questions along the way. And our speakers, are you guys okay with some brief interruptions along the way or you wanna hold everything to the end? I'm flexible. However you guys wanna to, want to do it, it's fine with me. Yep, okay. that works. Seeing some nodding, that's great, okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Lance um, and let uh, Lance Clammy talk. Hello, how are you tonight? Hey, hey, thanks for joining us. This is the uh, fourth of five events we're having. We've got another one coming up on May 11th with DNR staff, We're looking forward to that. But tonight we have the uh, Toronto Limited National staff that are residents of our area, uh, who are the boots on the ground and the people getting the work done with us. Uh, these are our intimate partners. We work with them on e almost everything we deal with. We work with them directly and they're a huge asset for us. Uh, with us tonight, we have Nicole DeMole. Uh, Nicole is the original Toronto Limited National employee in the state of Michigan in 2010. So it's hard to believe it's been 11 years, Nicole. And she is the Great Lakes Habitat Program Manager. Uh, we also have Jamie Vaughn with us. Jamie's been with us since uh, Trout Limited since 2015. And she is the Rogue River Home Rivers Initiative Project Manager. And then our newest TU uh, staffer who just recently moved into Cannon Township here uh, is the Jake Lemon, who is the Eastern, Eastern Angler Science Coordinator. Uh, and again, these people are invaluable in the work that we do as a chapter. We rely on them. Uh, we like to think we have a very active and beneficial partnership with Toronto Limited National here. Uh, we're very happy to have them here tonight because in, have your questions or anything because these are the people that do the work on the ground. They're the ones out, way, uh, they're out mucking it up. They're pulling loggers. They're putting loggers in the planting trees. So uh, ask away. They've kind of opened it up for questions along the way. So don't hesitate to put it in the chat room and we'll ask them. Uh, but thanks for coming tonight. And uh, who, Nicole, are you going to go first or Jamie, are you going first? Yep, I'll kick it off, Lance. Oh, thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Lance, and to the SHREMS uh, chapter for having us. Um, there are three of us TU National staff on tonight, but we do have several others. And so we're going to cover some of their work um, and give you an idea of the regions that they're working in. Um, but between us three, we're gonna kind of do a brief overview of what we've been doing in the Great Lakes region. So Jamie, if you wanna go next slide. So um, as Lance introduced everybody, um, we kind of have myself who has been here the longest and in the last five years, we've really expanded our staff in the Great Lakes region. And a lot of that was a push from the state council and also the local chapters knowing that we do have the Great Lakes in our region, knowing that Trout Unlimited was founded in the state, we wanted to see more national staff here. And so we have both Jake and Jamie, as well as Jeremy Geist, who's our Great Lakes Stream Restoration Manager. And he does a lot in Northern Michigan and I'll be covering um, a lot of his projects tonight. We also have Taylor Ritterbush, who's our Great Lakes organizer and he's in Lansing. Um, and so he does a lot with our policy and advocacy work. And then we have Chris Collier, who's our Great Lakes Stream Restoration Manager in Wisconsin, doing a lot of the same work we are in, in Michigan, but in that state. Um, Matthias Bonzo helps Jeremy and Jake and a lot of our other project managers uh, with project coordin coordination and our monitoring. Um, Chad Kotke, is our Great Lakes Stream Restoration Specialist. So he does a lot of our design work and survey work for a lot of our restoration projects. And then recently we just hired on somebody to help Chris 
uh, Danielle Nelson in Wisconsin. And so she's gonna help to coordinate um, a, a lot of our field work and, and survey work in Wisconsin. And then we do have an open position right now. We're looking to have a project manager in the Upper Peninsula. And so we're currently um, interviewing for that position. So that we're going from one to use a national staffer to 10 in the Great Lakes region. So we um, have a lot of great projects and I guess we'll just dive right into that then. So uh, we kind of have it broken down first into our watershed work. Um, and then our second portion of the presentation is talking more about what we're doing in the Great Lakes region as a whole. So this is just to show you um, some of the, the watersheds we're working in. And for tonight, we're gonna um, look in particular in our Michigan watersheds. So the first one, and this is, um, Jeremy Geis projects um, we did want to mention here is we're doing a lot of work in the Manistee River watershed. Um, this is a lot of reconnection projects. And you can see from this map here, we do a lot of that reconnection work in the tributaries. Um, and so we're opening up those um, cold water refugia areas, um, more habitat for these, um, for the trout here. And so they've Jeremy and his crew has done 35 miles of tributary habitat reconnection. And in the future, there's a plan to do six more projects reconnecting 20 miles more habitat. And Jake's gonna talk a little later about how he partners with um, project managers for their restoration work and doing monitoring as part of this too. So he'll get into um, the thermal mapping that they're doing in the Manistee. And I know the Shrems chapter is working quite a bit in Muskegon. Uh, TU National is working on one of those um, tributaries to the Muskegon, Bigelow Creek. And this is just to show you um, a typical reconnection project where you have a before picture on the left where you have you know, a culvert that's kind of pinching off a lot of the stream, um, making it hard for fish to get upstream and after with a box culvert there improving fish passage. So to date, uh, we've uh, connected 20 miles of Bigelow Creek and done some habitat work there. And this summer we're looking at three culvert projects. And this is, I think those three pro culvert projects will have opened up the whole Bigelow Creek. So we do not have any more reconnection issues or will not after, the sh after these three projects are done in Bigelow Creek. And then I wanted to mention the Pierre Marquette too. Um, there's culvert and bridge replacements that have been done earlier. Um, a lot of the focus now is looking at in-stream habitat. So we know that you know, wood, is, wood is important to streams, um, but we work with landowners that might have a fallen down tree that might be obstructing, um, extra, obstructing some of the river for canoers and kayakers. So we use a grip hoist, Jeremy and his team, to kind of manage that wood in the stream and keep it in there for trout habitat. And so we're continuing to do some of that work along with riparian plantings. And then Jake has done a lot of work with um, volunteers and TU members on red surveys. And they're finding that um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of these fish are using those uh, headwater areas where you have a cold groundwater uh, for the for um, habitat. Uh, next, Jamie. And then moving up to um, the Upper Peninsula, we're doing, starting to begin work in the Antonagon. And again, we are in the process of hiring a project manager to cover um, the Western UP. Um, but we are working with the Forest Service currently, and we have some projects to do a remnant dam removal. This is a picture of that here. They've already um, drained the, the lake area here, and so it's removing the rest of the dam. And then a couple um, projects on the tributaries with some culvert replacements. And specifically on the Antonagon, we're really excited about the potential to um, remove the lower dam on the system, which is gonna 
reconnects 67 miles on the East Branch. So we have a lot of projects that um, we've prioritized in the Upper Peninsula and we're looking um, for lots of implementation over the next several, several years in that watershed. And I'll turn it over to Jake now to cover the White River. Sure, Thank, thanks, Nicole. Um, so I've been leading a lot of our work in the White River watershed uh, over the past couple of years. When I moved out here in, in 2018, um, we just, you know, it was kind of identified as a, a gap in our um, focal areas. And I kind of got to know the watershed just to, through angling and, and kayaking and got some interest in it. Um, and so we started doing initially some monitoring and assessment just to kind of identify priority areas, um, identify potential projects, habitat limiting factors, and also, you know, build a connection with the local community and stakeholders. And so a few years ago, we um, hosted a, a, a training using our Rivers app, uh, which is a, a smartphone application that's designed to uh, photo document habitat deficiencies and, and project opportunities at a, at a watershed scale. And so we got, I think, about 20 volunteers to paddle and walk the watershed, uh, photo documenting some of the issues that are going on there. Um, and then we were able to leverage some of that to do a pretty extensive temperature, mon uh, temperature assessment. Last field season, we deployed over 30 temp loggers in the watershed just to kind of get a sense of habitat suitability uh, across the watershed and some of the, you know, some of the impacts on the thermal impacts in that watershed, like such, such as the White Cloud Dam, uh, which we found raised the water temperature about, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So significant um, thermal impact there. And, you know, springboarding off of some of this assessment work, we started doing some stakeholder organizing and worked with the Shrims chapter and the Fremont Area Community Foundation and DNR and a number of other stakeholders to develop the White River Watershed Collaborative. So this is sort of a budding group. I mean, we just had our first meeting a couple months ago. Um, we're just trying to get people talking and people collaborating. Um, there's various groups that are doing good work, um, uh, good work on the white, and uh, but not as much collaboration as maybe there could be to be most effective. So. Um, the white, we're, we're looking just to get people talking, get people collaborating and getting more and better work done um, in the White River watershed because it just has a ton of potential. And just to orient anybody who may not know uh, that watershed, it's basically positioned right between the Muskegon and the PM. And it's a, it's a tributary to uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, it's a, not quite as big as the PM or, or the Muskegon, but still a, you know, a significant watershed and one that has a lot of good cold water habitat and the potential for more. So um, yeah, good things happening there that we're, we're excited about it. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Rogue. Um, you may be aware that we have kind of a special initiative on the Rogue called the Rogue River Home Rivers Initiative. Um, we have a number of these across the country and they are kind of special, um, places that TU chooses to invest in um, to do watershed scale work. So there's tons of great work happening all across the country by TU staff and chapters, uh, but these Home Rivers initiatives are kind of an effort to be um, really strategic and look at the watershed as a whole um, to identify um, ways uh, to not just address um, symptoms of things, but really get to the root causes of issues that are affecting our cold water resources. So. Uh, the Rogue River is very diverse. Um, so the work that we're doing is very diverse. We have some population centers like Rockford, we have agriculture, and we have some beautiful wild and natural areas and kind of everything in between. So we do all kinds of stuff from getting kids out uh, to monitor their local trout stream at school, um, deploying all kinds of citizen science uh, programs and monitors and things like that, which Jake will talk more about. Um, we do protection, reconnection, restoration, and everything that we do, um, we are so lucky to have a wonderful community around us. Um, that makes the Rogue River so unique. It's a really high quality trout fishery, uh, but it is just 15 minutes north of Grand Rapids. Uh, so we have so much potential to engage, um, not just people who are anglers and uh, care about fishing, but people who care about clean water and like to know that when they're going out to kayak or just walk along their favorite creek that they have an invested interest in it, um, know what's happening and know what they can do to improve it. So um, we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary. So we've been doing work on the road for 10 years. 
And I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, one of our newest projects that we call the Rogue River Tree Army. Um, so we know that a lot of our cold water resources are vulnerable to climate change. Um, with our changing climate, our cold water resources are really stressed. And the Rogue River watershed is in particular because of that uh, proximity to Grand Rapids and this uh, growing and uh, kind of spreading uh, population center. There's a lot of development happening in the Rogue all the time. Um, it's a very dynamic and ever-changing watershed. And we want to make sure that it can sustain trout um, in the long term. Uh, you'll notice a lot of our work uh, is happening on the ground and not in the water. And that's because the Rogue River is sustained by um, its tributaries. And those are cold because of what's happening um, in the groundwater and on the land. Um, so we, we really focus um, at a watershed scale. We know that if we take care of the land, um, that our water uh, will be clean and cold and able to sustain trout. So, um, however, we're facing this big uh, threat of climate change. So we wanted to take some bold action uh, to make sure that these uh, tributaries can stay cold um, so that our Rogue River can continue to sustain uh, trout fishing and trout populations. So um, we came up with the idea of the Rogue River Tree Army. Um, it's inspired by the Civilian Conservation Corps and Roosevelt's Tree Army that put millions of men to work um, during the Great Depression and restored all kinds of um, uh, wild uh, public land um, out west that were damaged from logging and uh, aggressive farming practices and things like that. So we thought, why not uh, have our own tree army that goes out and restores uh, the Rogue River? Um, but in a different way, um, we want to incorporate climate science. Um, so climate change is shifting um, you know, temperatures and trees that are in the watershed now um, may not be uh, the right trees uh, for this watershed in 100 years. Um, and because climate change is happening so fast, um, there's normal species migration. Um, however, our trees cannot keep up with that. So we are using um, some really um, cutting edge techniques uh, to select um, really strategic tree species to plant them all along our cold water rivers and streams so that um, when that climate pressure really starts to kick in and our trees um, that are here right now are not doing and thriving um, well along these creeks anymore, they're going to have um, some new uh, species that are already acclimated to the area um, that can um, continue to forest and protect our cold water watersheds. Um, trees provide so many benefits to our cold water. They shade the stream, they reduce flooding, they minimize erosion. Um, their leaves and wood add uh, diversity and habitat um, for our fish and the insects that they eat. Um, so we, we came up with this crazy idea and we got funding for it two years ago from the Forest Service through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And we hit the ground running with awesome um, work crews and volunteers uh, during the pandemic. So this was all kind of a crazy time to get out in the field, but uh, we were able to pull it off um, thanks to our amazing community. And last year alone, we planted 17,000 trees um, across the Rogue River watershed. And what makes this a unique uh, tree planting um, effort, there are, there are tree plantings going on all over the country. Um, all of these trees are going in in really uh, thoughtful, strategic places on our cold water rivers and streams. So um, they're going in in areas that were hit really hard by the emerald ash borer, where we lost tons of ash. They're going in in areas experiencing erosion. Um, areas where we identified some really high quality cold water seeps and things like that. So um, here you can see the, the list of uh, tributaries that we planted along. Um, and now um, we've moved outside of the Rogue and our tree army kind of organically expanded to uh, West Michigan. Our, our forest, service, uh, forest service grant uh, wrapped up this March and we got some more funding from them to continue our efforts and expand. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, say that we're continuing our tree army in the Rogue, but we are expanding to the White, the Muskegon, uh, the Pier Marquette, as well as um, the Lake Michigan shoreline as well. So um, this picture is on a tributary to the Baldwin River. Uh, this was taken a couple days ago. Um, today we were out on the Muskegon, Nicole and I, we planted uh, 1,200 trees. Um, so our tree army is out in the community um, all along our cold water uh, rivers and streams, making sure that these uh, really special, um, beautiful, wild places can remain healthy um, for us and all of our generations to come. So um, over the next two years, we're going to be planting 31,000 uh, trees all along these uh, cold water rivers and streams. Um, and I told you um, that uh, the Rogue River is very diverse. Um, it has some population centers. 
um, where the, it doesn't look natural and there's a lot of development and a lot of impervious surfaces and things like that. Um, but we do have cold water trout streams running through them. So we have Rum Creek uh, that flows through downtown Rockford and we have Cedar Creek that goes through downtown Cedar Springs. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't care for those trout streams even though they're in kind of developed uh, built uh, environments. Um, so there are, some, are uh, some cool techniques that we use called green infrastructure. Um, that just means we're using a really small space uh, to kind of mimic the natural uh, water cycle. So this is a picture of Parkside Elementary School. This is in uh, downtown Rockford. Rum Creek is just north. Um, it's just out of the picture. Um, and this was a huge, huge lawn area. So this is a roundabout that parents used at the school to drop off and pick up students. And there are um, two storm drains on either side of this garden that flow directly into Rum Creek. Uh, you can imagine on hot summer days that this pavement, uh, the school parking lot, the roof of the school um, gets really, really hot and it picks up oil and gas from car, uh, cars and salts um, during the winter and just debris. Um, I'm sure that they're fertilizing these lawns. Um, so it's picking up all kinds of chemicals, all that stuff goes into these storm drains and goes directly into Rum Creek where we've studied and we know there are some really fantastic trout populations. So um, we look at this lawn and just see tons of opportunities. So we use a green infrastructure practice called a rain garden. Um, this is a pretty large and engineered uh, version of a rain garden. You can install them on your property and have them be very small, but they can also be really large um, and impressive features too. So this was installed in 2018 with a fifth grade class at Parkside. Um, and you can see um, we kind of put in these curb cuts in this roundabout. So all of that water that would normally go into that storm drain is being intercepted and being put into this basin. So this is just a basin um, that will fill up with water during heavy rains and it will infiltrate um, slowly into the groundwater, which gets nice and cold and then will enter Rum Creek naturally. So we're keeping all kinds of um, warm, polluted and just heavy flows out of Rum Creek too, which we know can uh, cause erosion and um, affect our trout um, habitat in there too. So this is just kind of a, a unique project um, that we're doing in the Rogue as well. So all kinds of different stuff that we're doing. And um, since 2018, this fifth grade class uses this area as um, an outdoor learning center. So the garden um, was just installed here, but now it's uh, teeming with native plants that support butterflies and pollinators and all kinds of uh, wildlife and they go out there and they care for it and they understand how what they're doing at their school is taking care of this really important trout resource for us. So um, we've got some really cool stuff going on in the Rogue and just some fantastic um, communities and students in our watershed that are helping us to care for it. So now um we are going to talk about what we're doing as far as like Great Lakes as a whole in the region. Um, so I think, Jamie, are you still up after this? Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, pivot and talk about some youth education programs uh, that we have. Um, if you haven't heard of Stream Girls, it is a really, really cool program that was developed by our TU national staff. Um, STREAM uh, incorporates uh, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And it incorporates um, recreation, which is for fly fishing and art, which we like to tie in for fly tying. So um, this is a picture of girls on Bear Creek in Muskegon. These are some Girl Scouts and um, they are studying their stream using their field handbook. And you can tell that they are learning about trout and watershed science without even knowing it because this was a like 90 degree day in July and they're in these heavy neoprene waders and they are seeking out these cold pools in the creek and getting low and trying to find some refuge in some cold water. So you could imagine how we took that as a learning opportunity to teach them how they are acting like trout, um, finding those nice cold spots next to the nice woody debris in the stream. So Stream Girls is um, a program that was developed to get girls excited about science. Um, the, there's a lot of research that shows that middle school age girls um, tend to pull away and um, just lose confidence in science and math and those subjects um, around middle school age. And um, they kind of lack that confidence. And because of that, we see a lack of women um, in science, um, technology and engineering and math careers as adults. 
Um, I'm sure you know that we also have an underrepresentation of women in fly fishing. So this program kind of weaves those things together and it teaches girls all about um, watershed science and exploring uh, their natural environment in a single sex learning environment, which uh, just makes them comfortable and kind of, you know, takes down all those insecurities and it helps them build confidence and it also gets them fly fishing and um, they pick up a fly rod at a really young age. They learn to tie a woolly bugger and they just absolutely love that. It's a, it's a great uh, craft for young girls and they make very colorful, cool flies and they do it all. Um, and they, they, they build their confidence and they do it from learning with um, female uh, mentors and volunteers. So we get some awesome uh, volunteers from the Shrems West Michigan chapter, but also from Fly Girls of Michigan. So um, not only are they um, with all um, of their uh, girl uh, peers, but they're also learning from women. So it's just a really cool way to um, build confidence in girls and get them into those um, areas where we see an underrepresentation of women in, as a, um, in adulthood. So we uh, began this program in 2017. We launched it with the Girl Scouts. And since then we've been doing weekend programs with them. Um, and we also do all kinds of other programs uh, with non-Girl Scouts. We do one day um, programs with some um, uh, groups like the Refugee Education Center. And we also do week long programs um, with nature centers in Grand Rapids. Um, and these projects have all been supported by the Environmental Protection Agency through grants. So we've been um, doing this program for a few years in West Michigan. And uh, much like our tree army, um, String Girls has kind of organically expanded into new areas. Uh, people who get to see this program and volunteer and witness this program and parents who bring their girls to this program just really, really adore it. Um, they see the importance of getting girls um, outdoors, getting them comfortable and exploring and recreating in the outdoors and just having fun. Um, so we have um, a few programs that are active in West Michigan, and I'm excited to say that this year we're launching a number of new programs on the east side of the state. Uh, so we're really, we're really excited to offer this program to um, new communities um, and make this program more equitable because we'll be reaching all kinds of communities of color as well who um, definitely lack that outdoor access and that high quality environmental education. So uh, we're really excited to see where this program will go. and. Um, it's a great way to engage TU volunteers. So if you're interested, we'd love to get you out helping girls to uh, um, fly fish and cast and things like that. Um, if you've ever seen 30 girls with a fly rod in their hand, you understand how much help we need for these events. So please uh, feel free to reach out if you're interested in volunteering or supporting this program. All right, I'll jump back in there. Um, so uh, as TU's community science and monitoring manager. I do a lot of work that supports our chapters and volunteers and partners and staff for that matter to uh, implement monitoring and data collection to that furthers our mission in various ways, whether it be uh, helping prioritize where we do our restoration work, evaluating the effectiveness of the restoration work we're doing, uh, helping protect the stream uh, through collection collection of baseline data or evaluation of um, trends over water quality or habitat trends over time. Um, and so some of the things that I do is, is, that, is bring uh, new and emerging and useful technologies to, um, to the organization. And one of these is what we call our Mayfly sensor stations. These are low cost, real time stream monitoring stations. So real time basically means you, the data is available immediately or in real time. So these stations are transmitting data through the cellular network to an online publicly accessible database where they're viewable pretty much immediately. And they're collecting data continuously, which really means you're, they're collecting data pre-programmed intervals. Most of our stations collect uh, data every 15 minutes. And so these are designed to collect water uh, parameters such as temperature, um, we do stream depth as a surrogate, so as for, for flow, so kind of like a gauge height. Uh, we do conductivity, which is the ability, water's ability to pass an electrical current. And it's a way of basically measuring, you know, if there's something in the river that wasn't in there before. Um, every uh, stream and river has a baseline conductivity that's uh, a product of the geology of the watershed or potentially the land use. And so if you see spikes or, or huge increases in conductivity, 
um, you can, you, it's sort of a cheap way of screening that is there something in there that wasn't in there previously. Um, we're also working on uh, setting up new sensors for these stations, such as dissolved oxygen. Uh, we're working on a new turbidity sensor. Uh, we're looking to do uh, depth measurements using uh, basically ultrasonic range finders. Um, so there's a variety of, of types of data that we can collect with these. But basically think of them as, as, as a, a low cost alternative to a USGS um, monitoring station. Uh, USGS is the, is the gold standard of water quality data, um, but that gold standard comes at a, at a high price. Uh, those stations, they can vary widely in how much they cost from, you know, depending on what they measure from 15,000 to, you know, 50,000 and even greater. Um, and all, there's usually maintenance fees uh, that go along with that. I know I had a chapter that asked uh, a USGS to, just to add uh, temperature to an existing USGS station and it was gonna cost $4,000 a year in perpetuity to do that. And so these stations, at least the configuration that measures uh, temperature, depth and conductivity, they run $1,500 uh, for everything. And they're designed for trained volunteers to do the ongoing maintenance. Um, it was developed by a group called Stroud Water Research Center, uh, kind of a water research think tank out in, uh, in Pennsylvania where I used to be based. I worked with them on this, some of that, some out there and then brought it to the Great Lakes when I moved over, over this way. So basically to you, we've set ourselves up to be sort of tech support um, for, these, for this technology. We can help chapters, um, you know, sometimes with find funding or, you know, alternatively, if they have the funding for the equipment, we can basically do most of the assembly of the station or all of it. Uh, help with the identifying good sites, getting the necessary permits, deploying it, um, provide training on understanding the data, doing the ongoing maintenance, doing the quality control that's needed, and then just sort of be ongoing tech support for, for using the technology. And so it's, it's, it's a really cool opportunity to uh, bring the cost down of collecting this type of data and creating very long-term data sets in our smaller streams and rivers. Uh, USGS, like I said, they, they're, they're, their data is the gold standard, but they're usually relegated to, you know, often the mouth of larger streams and rivers. Whereas at the price point that we have here, we can start to monitor smaller streams or get further up into the headwaters of some of our rivers and collecting these sort of long-term data sets. So most of these that are deployed are meant to basically be there in perpetuity um, and, and evaluating water quality over time, um, whether it's to evaluate the effectiveness of restoration work that's occurring or identify emerging threats in the watershed or just evaluate long-term trends. Um, we've put 20, I think four of these in Michigan and Michigan was really uh, kind of ground zero for the development of the in-house capacity for TU to support this technology. And we've since started to grow it outside of, of, of the Great Lakes. We've got um, some work going in New York. We've got a few in Oregon. Um, we're getting some stuff going in Tennessee. So it's really kind of taking, catching hold uh, and going. So they're, they're solar powered. Um, you know, the, the thing that makes them much, or lo much lower cost is that most of the parts are, um, aren't really designed, aren't, weren't really created for environmental monitoring. So it's sort of economy of scale. There's a limited market for environmental monitoring. So those types of equipment supplies are can be very expensive, but if you can use stuff that's used for like other kind of you know telecommunications or otherwise, um, and and then you can start to bring that cost down. But we do use professional um, grade environmental sensors, so we are collecting high high quality data, and that data is housed on a publicly accessible database called MonitorMyWatershed.org. So. Um, yeah, if there's, you know, we've, we've got a few, we've got a lot of these in the region. Uh, Shrims has helped uh, help support a few of these stations in Prairie Creek. Uh, we've got some in the Coldwater River. We've got several in the Rogue River watershed. We've got some in some urban streams like Indian Mill Creek and Buck Creek. And then also up on the PM, uh, we've got one in the North Branch of the White, Manistee, Little Manistee. Big Sobble um, and, and elsewhere, and it's, it's growing. Um, so there seems to be a need and a market for this kind of uh, 
data at this price point, and we're just trying to basically remove the barriers to entry for, for watershed groups to, to get this type of information. Uh, next slide. So um, in addition, we're also working a lot with the Forest Service and other partners on doing monitoring to aid and kind of hone in our project prioritization. A lot of the restoration work uh, that Nicole highlighted earlier is done in partnership with the Forest Service. So we've gotten some added um, sort of support to enhance our capacity to collect, collect data in the watersheds that we're working in that will help us sort of fine tune our priorities and invest you know, limited conservation dollars in the areas where they'll have the maximum long-term benefit for fisheries. And so we, we do a ton of, temp a lot of this is temperature monitoring. Um, so they're, they're, we're deploying sort of networks of, of temperature loggers and watersheds like the White River, uh, the Big South Branch of the PM. Uh, we'll be doing some in the Little Muskegon. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, probably some on the Big Sobble, just kind of filling gaps in our understanding of the distribution of suitable cold water habitat. Um, this map you see here is of the White River. So basically blue is great cold water, green is good cold water, yellow is, is sort of starting to get a little marginal and red is, is warm. So you can see that a lot of the headwaters um, of, of the uh, white are really high quality cold water. If you can kind of see where there's like a yellow dot on the on the right side of this of the of the of the map, um, that's right at White Cloud where we have the dam uh, that we were talking about earlier. So you can see we go from very cold water to much warmer water below below that dam. And so it's information like this that really helps us sort of fine tune and hone in where we do our work. The picture there is a uh, is Matthias Bonzo, one of our, our field coordinator taking uh, environmental DNA samples. So this is a, a method of assessing what species live in a particular body of water without ever actually you know, touching the actual fish or whatever. Um, so you basically filter uh, five liters of water. This is a pump here that's we're, filter, we're running water through a filter and that's filtering out all the suspended material within a stream. And so as fish and other critters are in, in the water, they're sloughing off you know, bits of themselves and bit, those bits of themselves have their DNA. And so we can take those filters and analyze them for gen, genetic markers to, to determine you know, what species are in that particular stream. And so it's a very cheap and easy way just to get a sense of the distribution of, of you know, various species. So we were analyzing most of these for brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout. We did some for uh, some sculpin in certain areas where that was of interest, you know, you can do um, a variety, there's a variety of assay, they're called assays, basically, if there's a, a, an analysis that's developed for a particular species. You know, we could take these samples in 10 minutes. Um, I have trained volunteers to take these samples. It's not, uh, and, and it, you know, it basically, if you're just looking for presence absence, uh, it's a much more quicker and, e quicker and easier way than using things like an electrofishing backpack um, to do that type of assessment. So that's pretty cool. Um, we're also doing uh, a, a temperature assessment in the Rogue River watershed uh, this year, which is pretty cool. We're going to be deploying about uh, 30, 35 loggers in the watershed just to get a, a, do a broad assessment of the of cold water habitat suitability, just to aid for further aid in the prioritization and identification of the good work that Jamie's doing there. So um, yeah, it all it all boils down to just collecting data to help us identify where we should work. Um, and I see, a, I just saw a picture pop up, MWAT. What does MWAT mean? That's a good question. Um, so that's maximum weekly average temperature. So it's basically a metric for assessing cold water habitat suitability using continuous temperature data. So these loggers were deployed in, the, in these rivers and streams for, the, for an entire summer. Usually we get them out in spring, take them out in fall. And then we analyze that data to look at, you know, where it, it, whether there's chronic or um, acute stress on trout or stressful conditions for trout. So maximum weekly average temperature is the highest average temperature over any seven day period within the entire you know, time we are collecting data. So, you know, whether it's Sunday to Monday to, you know, whether it's or Sunday to Saturday, Monday to Sunday, Wednesday to Tuesday, there's some seven day period in there 
um, which is going to have the highest average temperature. And there's good literature and research out there that sort of ties the, that, that metric with whether it's good habitat for trout. And so basically, um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a way of, rather than just looking at maximum temperature or just looking at the average July temperature, it really looks at the entire season and assesses um, stress, thermally stressful conditions throughout an entire season. So that's what MWAT is. We can move on. So another thing that we're, uh, we're starting, uh, getting started this year is building our capacity to use thermal imaging to really dial in even further our ability to map cold water habitat suitability at a watershed scale. So um, here in Michigan, uh, a lot of our good cold water habitat is driven by groundwater. Um, seeps, springs, you know, water coming out of the ground that's cold, that's maintaining those good thermal regimes for, for cold water fish. Um, and so there's the deployment of temperature loggers, while it's, 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 you know, sort of the traditional method of assessing cold water habitat suitability, it's really useful for um, understanding sort of at a watershed scale where the good cold water habitat is. That being said, um, it's not nearly a fine enough scale to really assess where all the, you know, the important thermal refugia are located within a watershed. So when we're deploying those loggers, you know, at best, we're deploying them every mile. As you all know, a lot can happen within a mile of river. You know, there may be a tributary that comes in that warms up a quarter mile or cools down a quarter mile of it, or there may be a series of seeps that cools down a particular section. And so these thermal imaging um, methods are a way of basically mapping stream temperature at a very, very fine scale to identify cold water fusion as small as, you know, a, you know, a meter, a uh, square meter or so. And so basically the way this is done is by flying, um, you know, it can be done with fixed uh, wing aircraft or by a drone, which is the way we're going to do it, is flying these rivers and basically taking th imagery using thermal cameras to assess where there's good cold water inputs, um, finding seeps, finding uh, tributaries that are important, and then you know, informing our work, whether it's to um, you know, prioritize reconnecting to, to promote, promote act, access for fish to these seeps and tributaries, uh, fine tuning our placement of habitat features to make sure they're going in areas that are the coldest, that are likely to sustain um, good cold water habitat under climate change conditions because of those groundwater inputs. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring the ability to inform land protection using this. So by identifying where we have good cold water seeps and springs and tributaries, and then prioritizing land protection in those uh, recharge zones so that we can maintain those good cold water inputs in perpetuity rather than lose them to things like development, uh, land development and otherwise. And so we're gonna be testing this out. We got a grant or a, a, we got some funding uh, to basically do a, do a trial run this summer. And so we're gonna be flying a section of the Manistee River and mapping it um, using this technology, uh, doing the image assessment and creating these maps for some of the, for the, uh, some of the uh, resource managers and groups that are doing some good work up there to aid in their prioritization. And then based upon the experience that we have there, uh, we see this you know, hopefully being a service that we can provide uh, to our chapters and our partners throughout the region. There are some groups that do this. Um, the Forest Service has a shop in Salt Lake City uh, that does this type of work. And really where this started was we, I got, a, I got a quote to have them come out and do some of these assessments on a stream. And it was extremely expensive. And I just thought, well, maybe we can do this as well and do it for a lot cheaper so that it can be done in more areas. Um, so it's exciting new thing uh, that we'll be testing out this year. And, um, yeah, so in, and just to give you a sense of some of these maps, I mean, it's a lot of it's pretty intuitive, but you see um, sort of in the top left there, we have a river. You can see basically we get sort of a color coded scheme of where the seep is. So we see that purple seep coming in and we can identify where there's some cold water coming in. On the right, you're seeing a cold tributary come in. Um, you know, sort of just an anecdote that made me think of, we were on the big south branch of the of the Pierre Marquette last year doing a temperature assessment. And we just happened to drive over the stream that wasn't named. It was, a, it was an intermittent stream on the, on the topo maps. 
and there was just a ton of flow. Um, so we popped down in there and it ended up being, we saw Brook Trout ended up being the coldest stream that we, uh, sat, that we, that we uh, deployed a logger in, in the entire watershed. And we never would have known about it if we didn't happen to just notice it as we drove by. Whereas if we were doing a watershed scale assessment using this imagery, we would find every small stream and river that's providing that good cold water um, in the entire watershed. So I think it's a pretty exciting thing that we're, we're excited to get off the ground. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Jake, there were a couple of questions really related to temperatures. Um, can, can we ask those now? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, Ray White asked, um, trout dive from high temperature that persists for a certain period on any given day, not from any average. With the temperature records you have, can you describe the number of minutes or hours of temperature above certain important levels that happen each day? Yeah, so that, you know, would get at acute um, impacts uh, for on, on individual fish. And there are some metrics that you can use to look at that. Um, I've actually been talking with Brian Burroughs, who's the, I'm sure most of you know, he's the executive director of Michigan TU, about applying some of those metrics to some of the places that we looked at in the white um, and to identify, you know, where we're getting some of that, that acute stress. Um, the maximum weekly average temperature is sort of a broad brush stroke. And it's a way at looking um, at what, rather than at what areas, you know, would we have necessarily have um, mortality or um, negative impacts from acute temperature spikes. It's looking at areas that just generally provide good cold water habitat, generally provide don't or don't provide good cold water habitat or somewhere in between. So there's sort of different ways of looking at it, sort of the acute versus, versus chronic. Okay. And it, it was asked, and maybe it's already been answered in here, but is this data available to the public at this point, or what's the story with that? So the temperature data, um, I do have and in, in, in publicly accessible uh, web maps. You know, I'm, there's, they're housed um, on arcgis.com. Uh, I mean, if you search for it, Googled them, you could probably find them. Um, I could also send links as well. So it is publicly accessible. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, there, there was a, a, a much larger question about Muskegon River um, that I think we'd like to come back and maybe spend a, a bit more time on and not to totally interrupt the flow of um, what you guys got going on here. So let's come back to that in just a moment if we can. And I'll let you guys proceed. Okay, yep, we only have a couple more slides. So um, yeah, there's lots of great questions. I did wanna mention that uh, Jeremy Geis is also working on uh, the New Zealand Mud Snail Collaborative. And this is you know, a group of nonprofits, uh, agencies, universities that are coming together to monitor and detect and really do a lot of outreach and education about um, this invasive species. So um, they do have a webinar series that they're doing started in February, but there's still many opportunities to tune in um, in May, June, and July. So I just wanted to um, mention this um, obviously we're going to help stop the spread from anglers and, um, you know, education about how those spread into our river systems. So, um, Jamie, you go to the next slide, uh, the webinar series, along with all of the, the work that we do updates, um, volunteer opportunities, we do get out on social media. So we do have um, our Great Lakes program is on Facebook, um, also on Instagram. We do put out an annual Great Lakes newsletter as well. Um, and each of our project managers contribute articles and a summary about what they do in, in their areas. And then we do have uh, blogs about our projects on tu.org. So there's lots of opportunities to plug into our programs and for you guys to um, figure out what's going on and some opportunities to help volunteer. Um, so I think um, if you have questions, we can go over the, the questions in the chat. Um, Dave, if you wanted to 
Well, yeah, not, for sure. You know, there's a, a good, uh, it's kind of a big question and it comes from George Hartwell. Um, and he asks about the Muskegon River. He says, I'm a, and I'm reading this off because uh, maybe not everybody has access to see the chat. And so uh, we want to, uh, for people who may watch this at other ways, they know what's going on. He says, I am a board member of the Muskegon River watershed. And I just want to thank to you not only for the important work in this watershed, but for the great partnerships we have formed between our organizations. Currently, the Muskegon River is nearing an 85 year flow as a result of drought. Consumers Energy has chosen this time when steelhead and sturgeon are spawning to implement a drawdown of eight feet on Hardy Pond. Drawdown of eight feet on Hardy Pond. He says, I'm especially concerned about the impact of the drawdown and low rainfall on spawning patterns. Any comments or thoughts from you know any TU staff on, on that particular issue? And if you're not an expert, well, comment was, I think in, okay. 2000, in 2017 you had a, a low. I think it was below 850 in the flow meter, and I believe about half the bed, the the riverbed from Croton down to close to Thornapple was exposed. Uh, for a period of time, I believe it was around 24 hours, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, the interesting thing we, we found is that, so Schrems has 14 temperature loggers in the, in the Muskegon between Croton and Nuego. Uh, we will be, next next week, they're going back in the river. This will be our fourth season of measuring. Now, Nicole has a copy of that data. We haven't found a method to share that yet. And with Nicole, possibly you can find a way to get for people to access that data. The problem was is the file is so big, it can be emailed in traditional manners. So we found that the temperature problems in the Muskegon exist during high flows, not during low flows. During low flows, the areas of cold water tribs and seeps have a chance to cool down the river in spots, not the whole river, but there's enough cold water seeps in there to allow fish to survive the hotter temperatures. And again, it's when the water flows are up is when the overall water temperatures increase, creating problems for trout in the majority of the river. Um, so it was actually contrary to what we thought we would find going in. Um, but we're still continuing to work on that. So, Yeah, Lance, I'll throw in one thing. I, I, uh, in just an opinion, and I might be wrong, but I, I feel maybe you're not quite comparing the drastic drawdown to our monitoring that happened. Uh, the monitoring that happened over the last four years, I don't think was during that time of dramatic no, it came, um, it came drawdowns. Year after. So I, I wouldn't you know, necessarily arrive at that same conclusion with what could potentially happen. What we found during that drawdown is basically consumers has the right to discharge whatever water they wish from the, from the dam sequence for the benefit of their dams. Right. If I may, I jump in here, Lance. And, Please do, George. And, uh, I mean, I they do have the right to do that, and they, as a matter of fact, they can draw Hardy down to, um, I believe it is 12, 12 feet, um, and but but simply because they have the right to do it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And, and, you know, and low flows, uh, while, while, while your temperature loggers may, may show that they are, you know, that, that, the, that it doesn't impact the temperatures negatively. Um, oh, we lost George here. We did. We lost George. Um, um, George, you know, the question I have is I was a Hardy Dam resident uh, in that area for a long time. Traditionally, they would draw down eight to 12 feet every winter for flood control. Um, I'm curious if George gets back on, if this is an additional drawdown in a, in a, on top of what they normally draw down for wintertime for flood control. Does anybody have an answer to that question? The, on the uh, Consumers Energy website, it does talk about the Hardy Pond drawdown schedule, um, that it was going to happen in early January. Um, but restoration, uh, normal, uh, normal restoration was going to be at May 28th. So hmm. that seems kind of dated information or, or we're not, they're not talking about the same thing. It's due to a, uh, well, they're auxiliary working spillway project. 
They're just right. They're doing maintenance on the dam. They've got a big project going on. Okay. Yeah. And so we've. we've, we've yeah, lost. I guess we don't. I, I mean, I don't know that we have a good answer for George's question right now. I'm sure there's other PU staff who maybe have more experience with that. Um, and and also, I know Brian Burrows. With the state council is doing a lot of work on on the dam on dams, so um, we can look into that though a little further. Okay, I've got one off the our YouTube stream. Uh, someone asks, BD asks, uh, besides stopping the spread, are there? Uh, this is uh, regarding uh, the New Zealand mudsdales. Uh, besides stopping the um, the spread, are there any methods of eradicating the New Zealand mud snails without damaging existing macroinvertebrate populations currently, like a chemical that could only target them? Um, I'm going two for two. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that either. I would have to ask Jeremy, who's part of the, the um, collaborative um, I don't know, Jake and Jamie, do you know any, anything about that? All I can say is that I think right now the primary focus is stopping the spread. Um, you know, I don't, I haven't heard anything about any kind of treatment, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm not, I'm not the expert, but I can just say for now that the, the focus is, is heavily on stopping the spread of it. So. Hey, George is back online with us. Um, George, we were talking about the Muskegon and we're talking about the drawdown in Hardy Dam Pond. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the drawdown of eight to 12 feet happens every winter for flood control, at least it has in the past, but this year it was delayed because of maintenance in the dam. Is that correct? Well, that's right, uh, Lance. And I'm sorry I, I dropped off there. That's rural internet for you. Um, it, it, uh, there, there, there's a major uh, construction project uh, planned for the dam uh, this this summer. I believe um, was at least in part responsible for that, or responsive to that, I should say. Um, but but I guess my concern is that the um, I mean this is the this is the time of year when with sturgeon and and steelhead spawn when. Not only temperature is important, but also the um, the, the the flow is important. The, the the sturgeon won't come upstream, and I don't think the steelhead will either. Uh, if 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 in a low flow, so it ju just the coincidence of their drawdown with a historic um, eighty almost eighty five year um, low flow is is it's distressing to me. Yeah, I mean, it does, it, it, you know, and it, it does sound like there could, there is the potential for impact. And like you said, a lot of those spawning um, runs are triggered by flow. So I certainly see um, why you would be concerned about that. I personally don't have a ton of experience or knowledge of, of what's going on in, in that, with, with that particular issue to be able to add anything um, specific other than to say that, you know, we could, we could reach out uh, to some of our colleagues who um, who are working on those issues and see and get some of their input. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, I. Unless I've missed some questions, I think we've kind of covered everything. There were some minor ones in chat that were uh, handled through there, but um, was there any, any anybody else or anything else I've missed? Uh, now's the opportunity. And I guess that's it then. Um, uh, uh, we do have another seminar coming up. 
uh, if you're so interested. Um, and that one is in, I think, two weeks from today. I'm going to throw a, a slide on the screen here. Um, and uh, you can see the date for that. It's Tuesday, May 11th at 7 uh, p.m. And, and uh, Lance, you may have some more information on this tonight. I do. We're going to have uh, four more uh, on the ground, in the water staff. We're going to have Kristen Thomas, who's the uh, fisheries biologist for Michigan Trout Limited. We're going to have Mark Tonello, who is a DNR fisheries staff person, Brian Gunderson from DNR fisheries staff person, and Jay Wesley, who is the Great Lakes Basin Coordinator for Lake Michigan. He's the guy to talk to about steelhead in West Michigan. So those are the four people we're going to have on May 11th. So again, another good show uh, with people in the field directly able to answer your questions. Okay. Thank you for that. I hope to see you all there. I think otherwise we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up and we certainly appreciate our TU staffers uh, here in the state um, spending their time with us uh, to put this together. Um, and not only that, but show up today. Um, it's, it's great. Your, your efforts are, um, we love your efforts. They're fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Thanks Nicole. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Thank you.